Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, it's pretty cool though. I mean, it's a nice thing to steal, but um, I think it's pretty good for doing these presentations. Well, uh, thank you, and thank you so much, Jeff, for that introduction. I, um, you know, one of the things I had mentioned to Jeff is that Jeremiah and I both went to school together and uh, learned to be transportation engineers before uh, he uh, adopted the world of 10-foot travel lanes and I adopted the world of zoning. So uh, these are the things we do with our lives today. I want to talk a little bit in the context of how zoning and land use regulations can make things work or not work for you. I want to take a moment to assure you that despite um, all of my uh, experience working in a, in a what, I, what I think is a very successful city in a very thriving little section of the world just near Boston that um, I also in those re in those 20 years that have brought me towards Somerville have also brought me around a number of other places just um, a little background on me in that I actually ended up working doing rural economic development work in upstate New York before I went to planning grad school and studied tra um, transit-oriented development, before going to work in Lowell for seven years, working on mill town type work and redevelopment of downtowns before taking me to Somerville, the, the densest city in New England. Um, and all along trying to focus on the idea of, of, of trying to figure out what the best strategies are for making better places. I, I like to come, I, I think it's my Greek roots, I like to come back to the ancient Athenians' perspective on this about um, constantly having generations transform places and making them better and more beautiful than they were before. But as time has gone on, I think we've discovered something that I, I, I like the Einstein quote to describe best is that you know when you work to solve your problems with the same thinking you use to create them, you get in trouble. So, I think that's what's been particularly interesting to me over recent years looking at where we have all of these great ideas and we have all of these concepts of wanting to implement to make places more walkable and, and, and places more accessible, that we tend to run into circumstances where today some of our largest challenges come from the fact that we're still using days ago's planning solutions to try to solve today's problems. So I want to go with the theory that the best way to predict our future is to invent it, to show you how we've been trying in Somerville and other places have been trying, and some other examples I have, to, um, to, to invent a better place by the way they've created it, mainly using design and um, design-based solutions to address their land use regulation system and, and, and the pieces of everything else that go, that go with it. So um, I want to talk a bit about zoning. I want to talk about, about, about the most exciting thing that you can discuss just before lunch in a presentation. So, um, and, and, and for those that don't know, I mean, people kind of get the vague idea of what zoning does. If you don't do it day to day, you may not know that the whole idea of zoning, you know, started, there was early zoning in New York and a number of other places, but in, in the early 1920s, Euclid, Ohio, really was the one that focused on the idea that what they wanted to do most was to divide their community in such a way and, and, and make sure industrial was in one area, and commercial was in another area, and residential was in another area. And uh, what happened in Euclid, Ohio, that was particularly interesting is there was a real estate company that really didn't want to buy any of this concept and um, sued them. And, and, and this group of group of, of esteemed individuals here, the I believe it's 1923 Supreme Court, um, ruled indeed that zoning the way Euclid, Ohio had created it was indeed legal and that you could in fact divide land this way and, and provide these regulations and provide these concepts. What they said at the time was it was a strategy to keep the pig in the barnyard and out of the parlor. Um, pig being those 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 industrial things, the things you didn't want around your your single family houses. Zoning in Euclid has been incredibly successful at doing exactly what it was supposed to do in Euclid, Ohio. Here's Euclid's modern zoning ordinance. Here is Euclid, Ohio today. Let's take a look. All right, there's the residence. There's the multifamily residence, there's the retail, it's, you see it's all lined up exactly the way they wanted it to be. Not really sure this creates much of a place, but it certainly achieved exactly what their code said. In fact, a lot of the places that were formed since codes were created through to today were created because people were following the codes. These architects will tell you that form follows function. I like to say form follows regulations. A lot of times form seems to follow parking regulations. In Somerville, 19, 1925, we created the Building Zone Ordinance, a 26 or so page document. Um, is this thing not working suddenly? <laughs> um, anyway, uh, it's a wonderful picture. 1925. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And 
of course, by 1990, our document was about 400 pages long in this big binder. And a lot of communities have done this. You sort of add on things to, to, to zoning over time, and you, you create zoning of a modern era. And, and, and I think many communities you'll see, you look at, they have regulations now that run from the, their latest, most significant upgrades or overhauls were sometime between 1960 and 1990. So Somerville's being a 1990 code is probably more modern code than many others, but, but let's put modern into perspective for a second here because this is, the world has changed a little bit since 1990. You may remember where we are on like data or communications or, 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 or even priority of travel and sort of where a place like Somerville and a lot of other communities look like as their priorities and, and, and as, as the, you know, the way we deal with data the way we deal with communications, the way we deal with even what our priorities are in our community about how we get around and where we go may have changed. What hasn't changed is the zoning. So what we have is a system failure. And the way we try to address the system failure is, is through what I want to highlight as sort of a four-step process that I believe is relevant to any community trying to make sure that your land use regulations and where you want to go actually work. The first is to make sure that you know where you want to go. Now, our, our strategy in Somerville has been basically to focus on using the planning charrette ideas. A lot of new urbanists talk about um, sort of bringing, bringing group into the community, kind of doing things, do, doing a quick planning charrette where we move into a neighborhood, we focus on the details, and we bring a great design team, and we, in six days, come up with a, with a solution to all of the world's problems. And, and, and you know, I do, I do love doing that, and, and that does work a lot of times in a lot of communities. What we did find in Somerville, and what I found in some New England communities, is it's a little difficult to adopt the idea that you can solve every question you need to solve in a six-day charrette. We have taken the concept of the new urbanist charrette and some really unpacked the pieces and sort of spread them out a little bit longer. We do what some charrettes do in seven days, we do in probably three months, which is still, compared to a two-year planning process, still fast, but nonetheless allows a couple of weeks in between for kind of recovery time and sort of processing time to think about where things should go. So we, you know, we started with our comprehensive plan, which actually took a little longer than that. It took, I think, two and a half years. Um, you know, we spent time with the community, we, we've, we've, we've learned what folks wanted, um, and then as we've drilled down, we've created neighborhood plans that have been very much oriented around um, design of neighborhoods and design solutions, both short-term and long-term. Um, I love pulling together a team, Jeff participated in one of our teams, Russ Preston, who's in the back at the Somerville booth, has participated on quite a few of our teams. David Carrico here, who Jeff actually introduced me to, is. Uh, the fastest renderer I've ever met, can draw just about anything in an hour, um, has participated in a lot of our teams, and it's really, that it helps us really visualize what possibilities are. We do some follow-up, do some presenta do a presentation six weeks later, kind of show people the results of things, and the result is that we get an inspiring vision for growth, and I think it's important to be aspirational but still realistic about where we can go as we do our planning and pre preparing for these things. So long-term big picture across our city, we did a comprehensive plan, a lot of people do that, but my goal for our summer vision plan, there are three things I thought was very important. First of all, that it be a very accessible document, that we strip the planner speak out of the document, that we make it work for anybody, we make it accessible, we even tried to make the cover pretty, um, and, so it, and, it, and it's got a lot, of, a lot of character to it. The second, that it have a elevator speech type response as to what we're trying to accomplish, that it have an aspirational explanation of what we can do that I can explain to people in five seconds. We want to build 6,000 new housing units, create 30,000 jobs, make sure 85% of that is in the transformational side of our city, and make sure at least 50% of our new trips are walking, biking, or on transit. And my biggest regret in this plan is that that 50% number I think is actually too low. But I do believe that, you know, I can explain it to people, people get that. When they first look at me and I say 6,000 housing units, they say, we're the densest city in New England, where are you gonna put those 6,000 housing units? I say 85% of them are in those transformative areas and it all kind of fits together. And then how it fits together is it fits together with a map. Now, um, my good friend Kara Wilbur keeps reminding me that we need to, 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 to think very carefully about how we do 
land use maps and comprehensive plans. And, and I really think that we found a very innovative solution to deal with mapping in, in our comp plan. And there's, there's two maps in our plan that are really the significant core of what we're trying to do. The first, which I call the summer vision map, which is basically very simply areas of the city to conserve, the places we don't want to change much, those residential neighborhoods we love, areas to enhance, which are the corridors where you can do incremental, small-scale development with limited infrastructure investments and a lot of opportunity to make small-scale change, and areas to transform, which are the place where we want that 85% of new development to occur. That is where you're making significant investment in order in, in order to get bigger returns that's the map a little bigger um, and um, the second map was the map that when I was doing the comp plan I started calling the land use map and I said oh, you know everybody does a comp plan to do a land use map this is our land use map it actually took one of our elected officials to come into one of my meetings one day and say to me that's not a land use map I'm like, well, what do you mean it's not a land use map? I'm a city planner, it's a land use map he goes but but your districts they're, they're not like they're not uses I kind of looked and I went, oh, look at that, that's kind of interesting. Because I don't, he says, where's the commercial district? Where's the industrial district? All your districts are mixed use. All your districts are mixed use. How can that be a land use map? And I said, well, that's really interesting because it's actually not a land use map. We started calling it the land context map because what it was was really a map of how much intensity of development we wanted, not really how much, what use we wanted to go where, which was an important lesson for how we were gonna do our coding work later. Um, and, and it's very fine-grained. I tried to zoom in a bit, it came out really grainy, but you can see that we sort of said, you know, where's the, where, where's the district of houses, where's the district of apartment buildings, where's the district of mixed-use buildings, and what intensity are they? You know, as we've done our zoning, we've looked at it, it's like we have a three-story mixed-use, a four-story mixed-use, a five-story mixed-use district, depending upon where our squares are. These are, this is one of the neighborhood mixed-use. It's basically a three-story mixed-use district, and it kind of describes what that is and how that works. It's not a, that's not a land use. It's not really what it is. So, um, and then the last thing is making sure we have an illustrated vision. And we didn't do this as much in our comp plan, but we've done it as we've done plans in each of our neighborhoods to follow up. So the key thing our comp plan said is go into each of our neighborhood squares and determine where you want the future of that place to go. Come up with a physical design plan for that place that we can create a code off of. And um, Gilman Square being one of those neighborhoods, this is our, this is our physical design vision. This is a, a determination of what we want that place to be. Um, and we have some really specific stuff that we put together about how that would work. This site is very interesting. The, the piece on the bottom of the plan there is a future MBTA Green Line station that should open in about six years. Um, and uh, I'll show a little bit later some renderings of what this actually looks like today. But basically this is a matter of reorienting a street that currently is a wide open intersection and uh, creating and, and dropping a series of four-story infill buildings on five lots to create a neighborhood center where today is basically one really nice restaurant and otherwise kind of a, a wasteland of a couple of gas stations. So that's, that's the idea of what we've been trying to do to prepare for making zoning work better for us. The second thing I want to focus on is to measure what you care about. And this is fundamental to a lot of form-based code style zoning strategies and solutions. Um, Somerville's code has some hybrid pieces, some of it's form-based, some of it's some other uh, pieces, but fundamentally, you know, if, if, if you try, try to consider what you do care about, you know, your neighborhood Main Street, your corner stores, your walkable neighborhoods, the things that Jeff and Chuck were talking about today and that we really see our valuing and find important. And we try to get an idea, this is Lowell, this is one of our, one of our downtown areas right next to where a lot of the mills are. Um, see what's important, this is one of Somerville's walkable neighborhood streets. Understanding what they are and how they work and how to measure them is an important piece of making this work. So you look at the measurement tools we use today, the solutions, today's solutions or, or last year's solutions to these problems. So you look at zoning, you know, zoning regulates setbacks, the area in which you cannot build, right? So this building right here has the exact same setbacks as the house next to it, so of course it's gonna be contextual because the setback is right. Okay, so that didn't work. All right, so then we, my favorite is lot area per dwelling unit or, or, or sort of a density requirement, right? Because if I get buildings at the same density, I get the same results. So if I have a row of like old classic apartment buildings and I try to drop something that's the same density, it might work, it might sort of work. It might end up with a whole bunch of garage doors in what's probably the wrong place. So it's kind of okay. And then I get floor area ratio, my favorite. A, a, a concept which was, by the way, invented to regulate skyscrapers in New York City. 
And we apply them to houses in Somerville. Actually, we, we go a step better. We apply net floor area ratio requirements, which means if you finish your basement and you go over your floor area ratio, you need a variance to turn your basement into a family room. This is what we get out of our 400 code. Floor area ratio is like playing with Play-Doh. You, you get an amount of Play-Doh and you basically can build and you can create blocks and you have so much Play-Doh for your, based on your lot size, you can lay out your Play-Doh any way you want. You can, you can get some great buildings out of Play-Doh or you can build a dinosaur. <laughs> so, you know, you can decide what you want to do with that Play-Doh. So you may want the corner store, but your floor area ratio may lead you to the, the 7-Eleven with the big curb cut, or, you know, you may want your New England Main Street, but you, if you regulate by setbacks and floor area ratio. This, I love this building. This is Lowell, and, and you know, I mean, I worked here. I, I can take some responsibility for this, but you can see this is, a, this is a very New England design because it's got the little Main Street up the top of the buildings. So therefore, it fits the context, but something seems off. Or you can get, this was one of my favorite Lowell building types before I, we rewrote the zoning ordinance there. This is the townhouse without a town. So it's sort of like just kind of, it, it's, it's townhouse style, but it's really all garages. Um, and then, you know, as you, if, as you keep going, you can kind of layer on top of that the parking requirements and the setbacks and all those other things. And you, you end up creating a series of places that are far more parking lot than they are a place and investments that are far more infrastructure than, than, than they are neighborhood. And then the solution that we have come to this problem in zoning, this is, this is the, the, the crutch we rely on to solve all of our problem is that sort of special exemption, special permit, kind of discretionary regulation which basically says, well, we know that this code doesn't separate bad things from good things, so we'll put them in front of a city board and we'll let them sort it out. And then, you know, we'll, 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 we'll create a group of findings and we'll say you have to meet these findings consistent with the general purpose of the ordinance. We'll not create adverse environmental impacts. These words mean diff different things to different people or mean nothing to anybody at all. And what ends up happening is, is th this is this is the recipe for the zoning board um, with the hundred screaming angry people on it. It's, it's, it's what brings out the, the NIMBYs because now it's like, well, you know, that, that CBS surrounded by, you know, two drive throughs and 150 parking spaces has the same special permit review as a three-story downtown building. So what we'll do is we'll just, we'll just decide that since we're going to do that, we'll just have to oppose everything. Um, it brings out the NIMBYs or what I call the cave people. Um, and they're just fighting these things because, because it, it all has become development that is part of this sort of suspicious process that, that, that causes these boards to decide whether or not to make decisions. So, so there's got to be a better way. I mean, I've spent a lot of time looking at form-based codes that have been done in different contexts in different places um, across, across the country. A um, little bit about what it does differently. I mean, form-based code, the key is it's not about giving up on use regulations. It's not about giving up on development. On, on, on you know saying you can have anything anywhere, uh, but the idea is that if each of these boxes, like how much of your zoning code is focused on certain things, there's more focus focused on form and less focused on use. Um, it's documented by, as I said at the beginning of this section, measuring what you care about. And we actually spent a lot of time in Somerville. Um, a lot of people love to apply these in downtowns. So we've been applying the concept in our residential neighborhoods as well. Um, trying to figure out kind of what makes a typical Somerville block, what makes a typical Somerville house. This is what my interns spend their summers doing. Um, and actually created a, a form that basically tried to understand how different types of buildings worked in our neighborhoods that made our neighborhoods what they were and made them successful. Kind of making a very simple type of that. You can create a building type, a building form standard that says this is what, um, this is what a typical house or a typical apartment building or something looks like. And then one of the things we've done in Somerville is we've added these component additions on, which basically say, if you want to add a dormer, if you want to add a home addition, or if you want to add one of these things to it, you can do that by right, no issues. Right now, our current zoning strategy was to make all our, our old neighborhoods, our classic Somerville neighborhoods, non-conforming, so that basically anytime you want to touch your house, you're in front of the zoning board asking permission to do so. It's a great way of making sure that you can do design review on everything. It's not a great way to stabilize housing stock, create value, and allow people to live and thrive and grow a family and stay in a place when you're telling them, oh, I know you wanted to add a bedroom there or do this or that, but you're back in front of the zoning board and your neighbor who doesn't like you is going to come out and fight it and all this crazy stuff can go on. So building form and building components have allowed us to get around that. You know, a lot of, a lot of form-based codes talk about architectural standards, but you don't, the, the goal of a form-based code is not to regulate architecture, it's to regulate base, the basics of building form, to get the basic pieces right so you've got the right things in the right place. I say that unlike playing with Play-Doh, it's, it's more like working with Legos, where you sort of have the component parts 
And what, you can put together the pieces to build what you want from those component parts and, and, and move them and work with them in different ways rather than just making dinosaurs. You do it right, you can administer it either in a town-wide application or, or a lot of people do it in commercial centers or neighborhood centers. But doing it basically uh, where you have all the de debates about what you want in your community up front and therefore getting individual projects approved under the code should be very straightforward. It shouldn't involve should either involve a simpler review, a design review, or no review at all, so that you don't have to have those case-by-case -case battles because you've had that discussion as you built the comp plan, as you built the neighborhood plan, you, and, and then built the code to match it so that um, these, these, these processes don't necessarily become overwhelming. Now, I'll say this, some communities love their process, like for instance, in Somerville, we love our design review. I, in a, in a neighborhood block building, we're never going to get out of doing that design review. We're still going to have to go through that process. But what I've eliminated is I've eliminated the debate of whether or not what should be there is a six-story building or a four-story building or is this or that or, or a whole bunch of things. I've narrowed it to really a design review type process. Now, where is it used? Everybody likes to talk about form-based codes. They are the award-winning Miami, Denver, Buffalo on the way, Flagstaff, Arizona, want to code. This is all great. but. I do want to point out, and by the way, this list that I have up here is about four years old at this point, so I know it's longer, but this is not a concept that is limited to places far off. There are a number of places in New England that have been working on this, that have been doing very successful at building form-based codes for neighborhoods, for, 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 um, for, uh, for downtowns, or for whole communities. I mean, uh, one example I, I just looked at, was pulled out was Simsbury in, Simsbury in Connecticut, where they were trying to address a clear downtown in an area nearby where somebody wanted to do like a, a strip mall type development, they pushed the strip mall development out and then they said, well, what do we want to do in its place? And the community came together and they decided, well, let's, let, let's talk about the design, let's do a design strategy, let's come up with the plan of what we want and then let's put a code together. This is the regulating plan, sort of the map that goes with that code that tells you what you can or cannot do there and then a series of form standards and basically it's done and now everybody knows what the regulations are that you can do there and, and how it works. Um, I, I, I loved following sort of the, the, the thoughts on this process about what it is that makes this strategy a good strategy for being able to implement placemaking and, and making it work well. And, and what I like about it is that it works for a lot of people from a lot of different perspectives. Um, you know, from the city government perspective, it shortens review time. Um, from those doing financing, it provides consistency of how neighborhood properties will be improved. Um, a quote from a home builder. The easiest way to facilitate projects is for municipalities to conduct and complete environmental review, establish desired land use, prescribe design guidelines, and expedite application review. This does all of those things. Um, but my favorite has always been this press quote about the, 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 the Santa Rosa Code. Um, we can't tell if it's a radical green left-wing document or a developer-friendly market-based right-wing one. Because the reality is it's both. <laughs> And that is what makes it so interesting. <laughs> it crosses political lines. It addresses issues from a number of different perspectives. And it makes it possible for, um, for a community to, to come behind an idea, un understand what they want as a community, and also be open, open to business and expedite the ability for somebody to do the types of things that you want to get done. Um, so, I want to stress it is not always the solution that every community will come up with for every problem, but as, as, as I've told a lot of folks who've done this, um, it provides a lot of benefits to the community, it codes the outcome of a planning process so the plan doesn't just sit on a shelf, it helps the community understand their outcomes in a physical form manner, um, it facilitates high value development in areas where it's feasible, the code alone will not cause development to come, like no zoning code alone will, will it, 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 if, it's not just a zoning code that spurs development, but it sets up the opportunity for it to happen. It can also set up the opportunity to make sure you don't get bad development or sprawl development in places where you don't want it so that you can force your investment back to the places where you want people to invest. It also has a benefit to property owners. It creates certainty on development options. The development ideas have been tested in the planning process so you don't have to deal with, the, with learning them all over again and making sure that you're in a situation where case by case you're trying to argue with the neighborhood about what you want because that discussion happened in the planning process up front. And the confidence that the neighbors will be held to the same high standards. When you build a project, 
If you go through that old style special permit process and you get beat up through that process and you build a quality project, you then have to remain vigilant to make sure that the person on the opposite corner from you isn't going to be able to do some drive-through, quick stop type thing that is going to take value away from your property because of the way they did it and potentially take profit away from your, your, your commercial development. At the same time, if everybody's following the same rules and the rules are set out ahead, you know that, that, that what you're, you're working in a certain game, you're playing by a certain set of rules, and, and that those rules will apply to your neighbors as well. I also want to say that one of the things that the form-based code does is it moves us past this use-based strategy um, that allows us to welcome some unknown and unpredictable things. I mean, the challenge with use-based codes is they have this incredible habit to list hundreds of things you can do and imply that everything that's not on the list is something you can't do, which works perfectly right until that one thing that's on the list that you can't do is the, isn't on the list that you can't do is the one thing you want to do. This is from one code in one neighborhood of one town in California. And if you look at the list, this is where things kind of get ridiculous. I mean, here's a community where you can sell chinchillas retail. You can, you know, that, that uh, there are words there. We always use a big word where you could have used a small word. So that's like means charitable institutions. But why say that? You know, one of the things I love, by the way, about, about great use codes is, is uses that are undefined. Physical culture institution is great because depending upon who's sitting in city hall or town hall that day, you can decide whether or not it fits that category. Because there's no definition for this. Uh, potato chip manufacturing, you cannot manufacture a tortilla chip here, to be perfectly clear, but you can manufacture a potato chip. Um, one, one thing I love about this district is you got your embalming and your tombstone sales in the same district. And just in case number 19 wasn't clear enough, <laughs> Number 135 on this list, Turkish baths. They, they do seem to really like their Turkish baths in this community. Um, and you know, we have a code like this in Somerville. It's got 297 lines in the use table. It's, it's utterly outrageous. I mean, it's like, like ridiculous what's, what, what's going on in that table. And yet, at the same time, we have things that people want to come in and do that we can't even figure out how to permit. Artisans Asylum, they walked into our office and said, we want to run a program that will allow people to, well, we're going to put up a 3D printer and a bunch of fancy construction equipment. We're going to break the area up into cubicles. We're going to rent them out to makers who want to be able to use the cubicle space. And then, while we're at it, we're going to teach classes there. And I'm like, well, what use is that? <laughs> like, I've never heard of anything like that before. So, and then we have Greentown Labs that basically is doing an incubator space for clean energy tech. And, and then we got, got folks who are doing art studios, half of them are probably living in them illegally. You know, all sorts of stuff going on. We've got folks who are doing, who are doing pottery classes and, 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 um, and, and selling art. And, and a kitchen incubator, that was a great one. The folks who walked in and said, you know, we're gonna build a kitchen, but we're gonna have five or six different caterers use it. My, you know, our like, health inspector's heads almost exploded. It's like, <laughs> how are we gonna make this work? Um, but the good news about Somerville is we've been really resilient to trying to address how to solve these problems. And in our existing code, we've worked hard, and despite the code, we've been able to do a lot with the maker movement, the creative movement. Um, this is, by the way, the place that does the classes and the cubicles and everything. This is Artists Asylum. I mean, they got some really cool stuff. And then we have we have this building. This is this is mixed use. This building, Rogers Foam and the um, Vernon Street Art Studios share this share this mill. Um, making um, um, creative foam and creative art in the same building. Um, and we realized that what our new code needed was it needed a district that, that identified these places, that protected these places, that makes our maker movement thrive. We created something called the Fabrication District, which is in our code draft, which I, I do hope will be adopted this spring, um, and, and specifies a group of uses that we defined, we defined broadly, we, we defined each one of them, um, and made sure that they allow a lot of creative stuff to occur there. Um, and make sure that all, all happens. So that's been my strategy for zoning. There is one little detail I want to add here that, that zoning is one piece of a problem uh, of, of a problem to be solved and an issue to be addressed. Um, another thing that we have been very focused on as we relate to how we're addressing zoning is also opening up conversations about how streets and spaces work. Um, what I what I, I I'm trying to make sure that we let the buildings and the streets create great places. And I think that's my fourth and, and final point. Um, as we've done these neighborhood shreds, and what we've done is we've gone into the community, we, we, we rent a vacant storefront, actually we borrow a vacant storefront. We spend a few days there, um, we interact with the community on, on, on these things, and we talk about kind of what we can do and how we can make streets work. Um, and what's necessary to do that. This is Gilman Square, where I showed you that watercolor drawing before. This is actually a 
will drive of what it looks like today. This is what you can build under the zoning. So just to get that right, there is see all the nice parking in front. Um, actually, if you really push your luck, you can build a little higher and put more parking in front. Um, and then this is what we wanted through our planning process. So we were very determined to make sure that this, both the intersection design, which sort of cut that corner off, um, and the um, and, and created the, the, the square, as well as the building design could work and, and make a place like this work. And that's been very important for us in the long term of development of these places. Uh, but in the process, in order to get people to be able to think about this, envision this, and see the future and understand, we have also focused on what we can do in the short term. When we create one of our shred spaces, we always do something outrageous out front. Um, this was not that fancy, it was a windy day, our fake grass was blowing around all over the place, but we stuck a piano in front of our charrette location in the middle of the street, which was fun because we were already doing a road narrowing project, so there was a construction crew across the street from us working on this while we were doing it, but why not? The mayor stopped by, you know, came to visit us with our staff, and, um, and we did that. This is a more interesting one, Davis Square. Um, Davis Square was doing the streetscape process while we were doing the neighborhood plan. Um, this is an, a 12 space parking lot that became really the, 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 the big fight of the streetscape project. And the streetscape project went forward with the plan that maybe someday in phase two we might look at the idea of taking this parking lot out and making it something else because it was so necessary to make the businesses there operate through the day. So we went in in our charrette and what we did is we, we closed the parking lot. Um, we didn't really ask permission by the way, which kind of got us in trouble. But, well, I mean, we asked the traffic guys, they put up a couple signs, they let us close the parking lot. A couple of aldermen came back to me and said, I don't think you could actually do that. And the traffic guys gave me the signs, so I don't know. <laughs> we put a couple of tables out, we invited a few food trucks to stop by. Um, and uh, by day three, um, we had a little party out here. Um, the, third, the second day, the second night, I took my staff and the consultants out to dinner. We left. The food trucks were just packing up. We went around the corner. We, 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 we went to one of the local restaurants, one of the brick and mortar restaurants who was complaining about the food trucks. I wanted to make sure they could see that we would actually hang out there too. So we went there. We had a wonderful dinner. We came back. The food trucks were gone. And all that was left was the tables. We were going to move them back inside of our charrette space for the evening. And about 15 people were sitting at them, just kind of hanging out in the middle of this parking lot. I was like, well, this is interesting. So, um, and by the way, through the three days, I, I, I never got, I, I didn't have anybody, you know, no business owner showed up at, my, at the door of our show. I mean, I was right there, I'm the planning director, I'm right there. You could have come by any time and said, hey, you stole all our parking. Now, it didn't happen because no one really noticed those 12 spaces were missing. But they did seem to notice that we created a space there. I mean, New York City's doing this too. You know, I know it's New York, it's Big city, people look at this, it's really complicated. It's like they took this space, they did all this stuff. How complicated is it to do this? But when you actually break down what these spaces are, um, they're a little bit of treatment on a pavement, a couple of granite blocks. Now, I know we have enough granite around New England that people can find a couple of granite blocks. A, a few planters and um, tables and chairs. Okay, this is not a massive investment. This is a pretty easy, straightforward thing to do. The next step up is you can create something like this. This, this is, um, this is Lexington, not too far from us in Somerville, uh, Massachusetts. Um, and this is a, um, a, a, a basically kind of built into the street space. They kind of leave this out here as a little outside place to sit. Um, pretty straightforward. It does take out a couple of parking spaces, but at the end of the day, it brings a lot of people in. So, like I, I like to say, if you plan for cars, you will get cars. If you plan for people, you get people. So think carefully about how the street side works together with the zoning side to make these sort of concepts work. So that's my focus on what, some of the things we've been doing in Somerville and some of the way we've been focusing on land use, streets, neighborhoods, maker spaces, and all of the things we can try to do to, um, to make a better community. So um, I think um, I have been the one remaining thing standing between you and lunch, so I will finish there and say thank you all for listening and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk. I think uh, for those interested, I'm going to lead one of these uh, roundtable discussion topics on zoning and land use stuff for anybody who wants to join us during lunchtime. Thank you.